Welcome to Saving Castles, the podcast for castle and chateau enthusiasts. Join us as we explore the fascinating history, stories and culture of these awe-inspiring structures, from the legends and folklore to the latest in restoration. We'll cover it all, so whether you're a seasoned castle aficionado or just discovering the magic of these magnificent buildings, this is the podcast for you. So grab your headphones and let's dive in. In the annals of history, where tales of knights, monarchs and epic battles intertwine, there emerges a figure enigmatic and awe-inspiring. A prince, not just any prince, but one donned in armour unlike any other. An armour of obsidian. As you sit, wherever you are, close your eyes and imagine a vast battlefield, the sun shining bright and amidst the chaos, a knight glistening under the sun in his black armour, a beacon of hope and dread, depending on which side of the line you stand. Such is the legend of the Black Prince. To understand this enigma, one must first journey back to 14th century England. Picture if you will, the vast landscape dominated by towering castles, their stone walls guarding the stories of the people within. A tumultuous time, Europe was a patchwork quilt of kingdoms, each vying for dominance. And amidst this chaotic tapestry, Edward of Woodstock was born. The year was 1330. England was experiencing a time of relative peace, a brief respite between battles, uprisings, and political manoeuvres. Into this world, in the regal confines of Woodstock Palace, King Edward III and Queen Philippa welcomed their eldest son, Edward. From the very moment of his birth, Edward was not just a prince. He was the embodiment of England's hopes and dreams, the heir to the Plantagenet throne, a dynasty that had seen its fair share of triumphs and tribulations. Growing up in the shadows of grand castles, young Edward would often gaze up at those towering walls and turrets, little realising that one day he would be the very subject of tales whispered in their corridors. Childhood for Edward was not like any ordinary noble child. Alongside the usual lessons of literature and arts, there was an added emphasis on the art of war and strategy. He was being moulded not just to rule, but to lead in battle, However, even in his earliest years, there were signs that Edward was not merely a product of his lineage. There was a fire in him, a thirst for knowledge, and a natural ability to lead. Servants and nobles alike would often speak of his compassion, his understanding of the plights of common folk, and his remarkable ability to listen. But it wasn't just his nature that drew attention. Young Edward was also a force to be reckoned with on the training grounds. Stories of his prowess started to spread, but along with these tales of valour, another legend began to form, whispered in hushed tones, of a special armour crafted from obsidian. It was said to have been a gift, some say, from a distant king, others believe from a mysterious sorcerer impressed by Edward's virtues. This armour, glistening and reflecting the world around it, would come to symbolise Edward's invincibility, his connection with the land he would one day rule, and his destiny as the legendary Black Prince. As our tale unfolds, remember that amidst the annals of war, politics, and the ever-present drama of royal life, Edward's story is not just of a prince or a warrior. It is the story of a man a human being with desires, fears, and dreams, armoured in obsidian, standing tall against the tides of history. The year 1330, amid the gentle hum of summer, the world welcomed a prince. Edward of Woodstock, christened in the hallowed halls of Woodstock Palace, was born not just as a child of King Edward and Queen Philippa, but as a beacon of hope for a dynasty. The Plantagenet line had navigated the treacherous waters of history, with each king and queen leaving an indelible mark on the tapestry of time. And now, into their illustrious fold, came a child destined to leave a legacy few could imagine. Woodstock, a palatial marvel nestled in Oxfordshire, stood testament to the grandeur of the English royalty, its walls a silent witness to countless secrets, celebrations and moments that would alter the course of history. 
Here, young Edward's first cries echoed, a harbinger of the life he was destined to lead. Yet, for all the opulence and grand ceremonies that marked his entry into the world, Edward's infancy was marked by warmth, love, and the gentle touch of his doting mother, Queen Philippa. As is the custom for royal offspring, Edward's future was charted out before he could even walk. But what set him apart wasn't merely his birthright, but the circumstances of the world into which he was born. The fourteenth century was a period of great flux in Europe. Territories changed hands, alliances were forged and broken, and the might of empires was tested on the battleground. Young Edward, with his bright eyes, would have been shielded from the gravest political dramas of his early years. But even in the protective embrace of Woodstock, he would have felt the weight of future expectation. Every gaze that fell upon him, every whisper in the corridors, was a reminder that he was no ordinary child. He was an heir, the future of the Plantagenet dynasty. Growing up, the grand halls of Woodstock and later, the illustrious Windsor Castle became Edward's playgrounds. But while other children, his age, played games of fantasy, imagining themselves as knights and princesses, Edward's life was already becoming the stuff of legends. His tutors, the best the kingdom could offer, introduced him to the world of arts, sciences and politics. Every lesson was a building block, moulding him to be a ruler in every sense. Yet, for all the weight of his title, tales from his childhood speak of a jovial boy filled with a zest for life. There are anecdotes of him sneaking into the castle kitchens to steal pastries, of challenging the castle guards to races, and spending hours listening to tales from far-off lands narrated by visiting dignitaries. But what was undeniable, even then, was Edward's courage. As a young boy, he once stood his ground, protecting a castle pet from older bullies, earning him admiration and setting the stage for the leader he would become. By the age of ten, while most boys would dream of adventures, Edward was being prepared for them. His training in the art of warfare began not just with the physical rigours, but the mental and strategic facets of battle. The clinking of swords, the weight of a shield, the strategy of siege— these weren't just lessons, they were preparations. But amidst all this, the heart of Edward's story in these formative years is not just about the making of a prince, but the shaping of a human being. Behind the armour, both literal and metaphorical, was a boy with dreams, aspirations and fears. As Edward grew, so did the tales about him, stories of a young prince who, despite his royal status, would sit with the common folk listen to their tales, and share his dreams. A prince who, in the protective shadows of England's grandest castles, was beginning to understand the weight of the crown he was destined to wear. But as the pages of history would reveal, the boy prince with dreams in his eyes was on the brink of a journey, a journey that would see him don the legendary obsidian armour and etch his name into the annals of time, not just as Edward of Woodstock, but as the indomitable Black Prince. The dawn of 1346 saw the world on the cusp of change. Europe, a turbulent canvas of clashing kingdoms and burgeoning empires, awaited a storm. And as this storm brewed, a sixteen-year-old Edward was thrust into its very heart, not as a mere observer, but as an active participant, a linchpin in the grand designs of history. The winds of war whispered through the towering walls of the English castles. As France and England locked horns, the Hundred Years' War, a protracted, bloody dance of dominance, had begun. Every castle enthusiast knows the importance of these edifices during wartime, not merely as structures of stone, but as bastions of hope, strategy, and power. In this volatile setting, the Battle of Creasy awaited. It wasn't just another battle. It was a defining moment, not only in the annals of warfare, but in the life of young Edward. Under the vast expanse of the creasy sky, armies amassed, banners fluttered, and amidst the sea of armoured soldiers, one could spot the gleam of Edward's own armour. Though not yet the legendary obsidian, its sheen was no less intimidating. King Edward III, a seasoned warrior, understood the stakes. But more than strategy and might, he saw in his son, the young prince, an opportunity. 
an opportunity to mould a legacy to allow Edward to step out of the shadows and into the blinding, often brutal light of leadership. The Battle of Creasy was not just a clash of arms. It was a clash of ideologies, strategies, and generations. The French, confident in their numerical superiority and the strength of their knights, charged. But the English, under King Edward and with young Edward leading the vanguard, relied on a combination of longbowmen and strategic positioning. Their tactics, innovative for the time, would change the course of medieval warfare. Imagine the scene. The ground trembled with the weight of advancing cavalry. Arrows darkened the sky like a storm of steel. And amidst this cacophony, the Black Prince, young and relatively untested, displayed a courage that belied his years. Every charge he led, every decision he made, echoed with the weight of destiny. His blade, an extension of his will, carved a path through the French lines, solidifying his place as a force to be reckoned with. But it wasn't just his martial prowess that shone that day. It was his ability to inspire, to lead men twice his age into the fray, to rally them when hope seemed lost and to stand firm, unyielding in the face of overwhelming odds. By the end of the day, the French lay defeated, and while many factors contributed to this victory, none in the English camp could deny the role played by the prince. Tales of his bravery spread far and wide, carried by wandering minstrels, discussed in hushed tones in the candlelit corridors of castles, and celebrated in the courts of allies. The young prince, they said, fought not just with his arm, but with his very soul. And while Creasy was but a single battle in a war that would span decades, for Edward it was a rite of passage. In the aftermath of Creasy, Edward continued to prove his mettle, the campaigns that followed took him across Europe, from the towering peaks of the Pyrenees to the winding rivers of northern France. Each castle he sought to protect or conquer added to his legend, and with every victory, the tales of his obsidian armor grew, symbolizing the unbreakable spirit of a prince destined for greatness. Yet, for all the glory and adulation, Edward remained grounded. In the quiet moments, away from the prying eyes of the world, he would often reflect upon the weight of leadership, the cost of victory, and the fleeting nature of life. For in the shadow of every castle he conquered, in the tales of every battle he fought, lay the undeniable truth of sacrifice, of lives lost, and of destinies forever altered. Picture, for a moment, a battlefield bathed in the cold light of dawn. The mists of morning drift lazily, curling around the feet of soldiers, their breaths visible in the chilly air. Amidst this spectral tableau, one figure stands out, not because of his stature, but due to his gleaming near-black armour, catching the first rays of sunlight, creating an otherworldly aura. This was Edward of Woodstock, but to the legions who stood against him, he was the fearsome knight in the obsidian armour. The term obsidian is typically associated with volcanic glass, known for its rich dark hue and razor-sharp edges. But did Edward truly don armour made of this material? The truth is more nuanced and equally captivating. Historical accounts, often intertwined with folklore, suggest that Edward's armour was not made of actual obsidian, but was a steel of such a polished, darkened treatment that it mimicked the stone's ethereal blackness. This was an age when symbolism played a pivotal role in warfare, an era where the colour of one's shield, the design of a crest, or the hue of armour could convey messages, incite fear, or inspire allegiance. Edward's choice, or perhaps it chose him, of this atypical armour became as much a part of his identity as his combat prowess. In an age where shiny steel and gleaming mail were synonymous with knighthood, Edward's decision to embrace the dark mirror-like finish was a departure from the norm. It was emblematic of a prince who was never bound by convention, always finding his own path amid the battle cries and clashing swords. But why this particular shade? Some historians posit... It was a tactical choice. A darkened armour doesn't gleam as blatantly in the sun, providing a modicum of stealth in the heat of battle. 
Others argue it was a psychological play, a means to strike fear into the hearts of adversaries. After all, in a world dictated by omens and portents, a prince clad in the colours of night and shadow was an ominous sight indeed. Castle enthusiasts and armament historians have long debated the origins and make-up of this legendary armour. Some fragments, housed in the hallowed halls of museums, are believed to be remnants of Edward's fabled panoply. They reveal a masterful craftsmanship, an alloy treated and tempered to achieve that characteristic hue without compromising its protective qualities. Beyond the metallurgy and tactical implications, the obsidian armour represented the duality of the Black Prince himself. On one hand, it was the impenetrable shield of a warrior, a symbol of might and invulnerability. On the other, it mirrored the depths and complexities of Edward as a man, his ambitions, his insecurities, and his moments of introspection. Much like how the armour would catch reflections, Edward too was a mirror to his times, reflecting both its glory and its tumult. Tales of Edward's engagements, particularly at the Battle of Creasy and the Battle of Poitiers, often highlight this armour. Eyewitness accounts speak of the almost supernatural figure darting through the melee, his armour catching the light in strange, eerie ways, making him appear both there and not, of this world and beyond. It wasn't just protection. It was a proclamation, a statement of intent, and a canvas upon which the saga of the Black Prince was painted. As years turned to decades and decades to centuries, the stories of Edward's obsidian armour transcended the realm of history and ventured into that of legend. Bards and minstrels spun tales where the armour was forged in dragon fires or bathed in the light of eclipses. While such embellishments are the stuff of fantasy, they underline a profound truth. Edward, in his obsidian armour, was not just a prince or a warrior. He was an epic, a symbol, and an everlasting enigma. Darkness has a peculiar way of seeping into the grand tapestry of time. Amidst the bright threads of chivalric exploits and gallant charges, there is a sombre strand, silent and foreboding, the Black Death. As the fourteenth century found its stride, this insidious plague cast its long, cold shadow over Europe, bringing with it not just mortality, but also a profound existential reckoning. The stately castles, those bulwarks of nobility and power, watched helplessly as their denizens fell prey to this indiscriminate menace. The hallowed halls that once echoed with laughter and merriment now bore silent witness to sorrow and loss. Yet it was in this crucible of despair that the true metal of chivalry was tested. Enter Edward, the Black Prince, a beacon of hope and courage in this bleak landscape. Even as the tendrils of the plague reach the shores of England, Edward's belief in the ideals of knighthood never wavered. Instead, they were redefined, reshaped to meet the demands of this new, grim reality. Imagine for a moment the dichotomy of the situation. Here was a prince bred for war, his very identity forged in the fires of battle, and yet he found himself confronting an enemy that couldn't be vanquished with a sword or shield. The Black Death respected no titles, no lieges. It was, in every sense, the great leveller. Edward's response to this crisis was emblematic of his character. He did not retreat into the safety of his castles or insulate himself from the suffering populace. Instead, he became a figure of solace and support. Historians recount tales of Edward personally overseeing the establishment of quarantine areas, ensuring that the sick were cared for and that the dead were given dignified burials. Chivalry, in Edward's worldview, was not just about valour on the battlefield. It was a broader, more profound commitment to the well-being of the realm and its subjects. He epitomised the idea that true nobility lies not in one's bloodline, but in one's actions, and in the face of the plague, his actions spoke louder than any heraldic crest or battle cry. 
It's poignant to consider the personal cost that this period extracted from Edward. Close friends, fellow knights, even family members. The Black Death spared few. The emotional toll of witnessing such pervasive death and despair would have been immense. And yet every account, every chronicle of that era, speaks of Edward's unwavering fortitude. There's a particular tale that resonates across the annals of time. A village, ravaged by the plague, had resigned itself to desolation. And then, one day, from the horizon, a lone figure on horseback approached. It was the Black Prince, in his signature obsidian armour. He did not come bearing arms, but aid, food, medicine, and more importantly, hope. For that village, and countless others, Edward was not just a prince. He was a saviour, a living embodiment of the chivalric code. The Black Death was not just a medical crisis. It was a crisis of faith. Many began to question the church, the monarchy, the very fabric of societal order. In these turbulent times, Edward's unwavering commitment to his people reinforced their belief in leadership and the sanctity of the crown. The age of the plague reshaped the European landscape in myriad ways. Societal structures were challenged, economies were upended, and entire lineages were erased. Yet, amidst this chaos, the legacy of the Black Prince shone brightly, a testament to the indomitable human spirit. His actions during this period underscored a fundamental truth, that chivalry is not just about martial prowess, it's about compassion about rising to the occasion, and most importantly, about placing the needs of the many above the wants of the one. The plague eventually receded, leaving in its wake a transformed world. But the tales of Edward's chivalry, of his selfless service and unyielding commitment to his subjects, remained etched into the annals of history as a beacon for all future generations. The sun had barely risen, casting a soft amber glow upon the plains of Poitiers. The year was 1356, and destiny had a grand spectacle in store. Here, amidst the rolling fields of western France, two colossal forces would lock horns in a clash that would echo through time. At the helm of the English army stood our enigmatic black prince, Edward of Woodstock, poised to etch another indelible mark on the annals of history. The stakes at Poitiers were astronomical. The Hundred Years' War, that sprawling tapestry of ambition, honour and betrayal, had already seen its fair share of bloodshed. But Poitiers wasn't just another battle. It was a defining moment, a crucible, in which the futures of two mighty nations would be forged. The French, driven by a burning desire to avenge their crushing defeat at Creasy a decade earlier, amassed an army of staggering proportions. King John II, confident and resolute, led a force that vastly outnumbered the English. The stage was set for an epic showdown. Edward, ever the astute tactician, knew that meeting the French head on in a conventional battle would be suicidal. So he banked on strategy, positioning his forces behind protective barriers and using the terrain to his advantage. The English longbowmen, who had proved their mettle at Creasy, were once again deployed to deadly effect. As the French initiated their charge, a cacophony of war cries, galloping hooves and the twang of bowstrings filled the air. The first waves of French cavalry were met with a relentless hail of arrows, decimating their ranks and sowing chaos. But the French resolve did not waver. Wave after wave they pressed on, determined to break the English lines. And here, amidst the smoke, steel and fury, Edward's leadership shone brightest. Clad in his iconic obsidian armour, he became a beacon for his troops. Stories from that fateful day speak of Edward fighting alongside his men, not as a prince above them, but as a brother in arms. His presence galvanized the English, instilling in them a belief that victory was within grasp. The battle raged on, with both sides enduring heavy losses. The air grew thick with tension, and the scent of blood and iron. Just when it seemed that the English lines might buckle under the sheer weight of the French onslaught, fate intervened. A contingent of English knights found an opening, launching a daring assault that resulted in the capture of King John and his son. This pivotal moment turned the tide irrevocably in favour of the English.
The French forces, witnessing the capture of their king, were thrown into disarray. Edward, seizing the moment, pressed the advantage, and by the day's end, the Battle of Poitiers was won. The ramifications of Poitiers were immense. The French, having lost their king, were thrust into a political crisis. The terms of John's ransom would cripple the French economy for years to come. But more than the tangible gains, territory, ransom, and prestige, Poitiers cemented Edward's reputation as one of the greatest military minds of his era. Yet, amidst the celebrations, Edward displayed a magnanimity that was rare for the times. King John, though a prisoner, was treated with the utmost respect and dignity, a testament to Edward's deep-seated belief in chivalry. The two leaders, adversaries on the battlefield, shared meals and conversations, forging a bond that transcended the brutalities of war. The Battle of Poitiers was not just a military engagement. It was a symphony of strategy, valour and human spirit. It showcased the best and worst of humanity, from the indomitable courage of soldiers to the horrors of war. And at the heart of this maelstrom stood Edward, the Black Prince, a figure who, in victory, exemplified grace, and in battle, epitomised valour. The tales of poetiers recounted by bards and chroniclers are not just chronicles of a bygone era. They are timeless reminders of the human capacity for greatness, resilience, and honour. And as long as these stories are told, the legacy of the Black Prince and that fateful day at Poitiers will never fade. Behind the towering legends of battlefields and the gleaming armour of chivalry, there lies a more intimate tale woven from the delicate threads of love, family, and personal sacrifice. As the curtains draw back, we glimpse the life of Edward the Black Prince, not as a military icon, but as a man, a son, a husband, a father. To truly understand Edward, one must first journey to the heart of the English court. Yet beneath this weight, young Edward's heart found its own compass. History introduces us to Joan of Kent, a woman of unparalleled beauty and spirit. Their paths crossed, and amidst the intrigues of court life, a romance blossomed. It was a love that defied conventions. Joan, older than Edward and with a past marred by scandalous love affairs, was hardly the ideal match for a prince in line for the throne. But love, as often is its way, paid little heed to the murmurs of courtiers or the dictates of propriety. Edward and Joan's bond deepened, leading to a secret marriage. In Joan, Edward found more than just a wife. She became his confidant, his anchor, amidst the turbulent seas of statecraft and warfare. Their correspondence, fragments of which have survived the ravages of time, paints a portrait of a deep and abiding love. They exchanged verses, shared dreams, and navigated the challenges of their royal roles hand in hand. From this union came two children, and in fatherhood another facet of Edward emerged. No longer just the warrior prince or the doting husband, he became a nurturing parent keen to impart his wisdom and values to his offspring. His letters to his son, the future Richard II, are filled with advice, anecdotes, and a palpable sense of warmth. Yet the wheel of duty never ceased to turn. Edward's responsibilities often took him away from his beloved family, into the heart of battles and diplomatic quagmires. The pain of these separations, felt keenly by both Edward and Joan, is etched into their letters. They speak of longing, of counting the days until reunion, of clinging to memories in the cold embrace of lonely nights. It was this delicate dance between love and duty that defined Edward's personal life. He was a prince of the realm, bound by obligations that stretched beyond horizons. But he was also a man with a heart that yearned for the simple joys of love and family. This duality, this tug of war between the crown and the heart, is what makes Edward's personal journey so compelling. There's a poignant tale that captures this essence. On a cold winter night, as Edward returned from one of his campaigns, he rode ahead of his entourage, driven by an overwhelming desire to see Joan and his children. 
he arrived unannounced, shedding his princely trappings to share a quiet meal with his family, savouring the moments before duty would call him away again. The Black Prince's legacy is vast, stretching across battlefields and courtly halls, but perhaps the most touching chapters of his tale are those that speak of love, of stolen moments amidst the relentless march of destiny. Edward's life serves as a testament to the fact that behind every legend, every icon, there beats a human heart with all its vulnerabilities, dreams, and desires. In the grand tapestry of history, the threads of love often fade beneath the weight of empires and wars, but in Edward's story they shine with a luminous glow, reminding us of the timeless dance between duty and desire, between the crown and the heart. Amidst the undulating landscapes of southwestern France lies Aquitaine, a jewel that for centuries was the envy of kings and emperors. Its verdant vineyards, bustling market towns, and opulent chateaus tell tales of prosperity and prestige. But in the mid-fourteenth century, beneath this veneer of tranquility, storm clouds were gathering, and at their epicenter stood Edward, the Black Prince. Having secured his legendary status at Creasy and Poitiers, Edward's prowess was not just limited to the battlefield. He was also a capable administrator charged with overseeing the vast territories of Aquitaine, which came under English dominion following the Treaty of Bretigny in 1360. It was a role laden with both honour and immense challenge. The region of Aquitaine was not a monolithic entity. It was a tapestry of various duchies, counties, and lordships, each with its own aspirations, allegiances, and animosities. To rule over such a diverse realm required a deft touch, balancing diplomacy with decisiveness. And as Edward would discover, the challenges in Aquitaine were as intricate as any battlefield strategy. Initially, Edward's rule was met with enthusiasm. His reputation as a chivalric leader, combined with a series of reforms aimed at improving the lives of the Aquitanian people, endeared him to many. He established a parliamentary system, reduced certain taxes, and endeavoured to bring about a sense of unity within this fragmented realm. However, the sheen of this honeymoon period soon began to wear thin. The local nobility, used to a degree of autonomy, bristled at the increasing centralisation of power. Edward's attempts to streamline the administration and exert greater control were seen by some as an affront to Aquitaine's age-old tradition. Tensions reached a boiling point with the imposition of the half-tax. While intended to fund military defences against external threats, it was perceived by many Aquitanians as burdensome and heavy-handed. Dissent grew, sparking a series of revolts and rebellions across the region. Towns that once sang praises of the English prince now echoed with cries of defiance. In this cauldron of unrest, the shadow of the French crown loomed large. Sensing an opportunity, the French began to clandestinely support the rebels, providing resources, sanctuary, and, at times, direct military assistance. The dream of recapturing Aquitaine, that cherished gem, was alive and kicking in the corridors of Paris. Edward, ever the warrior, responded with a combination of military campaigns and diplomatic overtures. He took to the field once again, leading his troops against insurgent strongholds, demonstrating that the fire of the Black Prince still burned bright. Yet he also recognised that the blade, though sharp, was not the sole solution. He convened councils, listened to grievances, and made concessions, all in an attempt to restore the fragile peace. But Aquitaine was a land of shifting sands. Just as one challenge was quelled, another rise. The region became a chessboard, with Edward and the French king moving their pieces in a high-stakes game of power and prestige. Amidst this turmoil, Edward's health began to falter. The once indomitable prince, who had stared down armies, found himself battling his own frailties. Yet his spirit remained unbroken. From his seat in Bordeaux, he continued to steer the ship of Aquitaine, even as stormy waters threatened to engulf it. Aquitaine, with its challenges and complexities, offers a nuanced view of Edward's leadership. 
It showcases a prince who was not just a military genius, but also a visionary administrator, a leader who could wield both sword and scroll with equal skill. He paints a portrait of a ruler who, even in the face of overwhelming odds, never shied away from his responsibilities. The Aquitaine chapter in Edward's life serves as a poignant reminder of the impermanence of power and the relentless march of time. Here was a prince, at the pinnacle of his prowess, grappling with challenges that seemed insurmountable. Yet, through it all, Edward's legacy in Aquitaine stands as a testament to his indomitable will, his ability to adapt, and his unwavering commitment to his people. The very essence of life, with its interplay of light and shadow, joy and sorrow, triumph and tragedy, is captured in the twilight years of Edward, the Black Prince. As the sun dipped towards the horizon, casting long, melancholy shadows upon the landscape of history, Edward's life began its inexorable descent into night. In the glow of youth and vigour, Edward had been the embodiment of martial prowess and chivalric idealism. His name echoed across the lands from the courts of Europe to the bustling markets of North Africa. Tales of his valour were sung by minstrels, and his image, armoured in obsidian, became emblematic of a golden age of chivalry. But like the setting sun that grows dimmer with each passing moment, Edward's once blazing light began to wane. The unyielding spirit that had once defied entire armies now grappled with an enemy it couldn't overcome. The inexorable march of time and the fragility of human health a series of illnesses began to take their toll on the prince. The robust warrior who had once ridden fearlessly into battle was now often confined to his bed, besieged by maladies. Whispers began to circulate about the declining health of the black prince, leading to an air of sombre reflection across England and its territories. This physical decline was mirrored by the challenges that continued to erupt in Aquitaine. The turbulent province, with its rebellions and intrigues, weighed heavily on Edward's weakened shoulders. Despite his best efforts, the dream of a united and peaceful Aquitaine seemed increasingly elusive. Yet even as his body faltered, Edward's indomitable spirit shone through. He continued to involve himself in matters of state, convening councils and engaging in diplomatic endeavours. His love for his people and his commitment to duty remained unwavering, even in the face of personal adversity. But amidst this period of decline, there were moments of profound personal joy. Edward's relationship with his beloved wife, Joan of Kent, served as a beacon of solace and strength. Their bond, forged in the crucible of political intrigue and personal challenges, remained steadfast. Joan, ever the pillar of support, stood by Edward's side, offering comfort and counsel in these trying times. Additionally, Edward took solace in his son, Richard. Watching the young boy grow and evolve, Edward saw in him the future of the Plantagenet dynasty. In Richard's eyes, the prince glimpsed hope a promise of continuity and the assurance that his legacy would endure. However, as the years progressed, it became evident that Edward's time was drawing to a close. Preparations began for the future without the Black Prince. The court, ever pragmatic, started to pivot its attention to young Richard, who would soon have to bear the weight of his father's immense legacy. In 1376, surrounded by his loved ones, Edward, the Black Prince, took his final breath. It was a moment of profound sorrow, not just for his immediate family, but for an entire realm that had looked up to him as a paragon of chivalric virtue. The nation mourned, bells tolled, and masses were held in his honour. Edward's passing marked the end of an era, a chapter in which the ideals of chivalry, honour, and valour were personified in the form of a single extraordinary individual. In the annals of history, many figures come and go, leaving behind a legacy that fades with time. But Edward's impact was such that his memory refused to be dimmed by the sands of time. Instead, he became a legend, a symbol of an age when honour meant everything and when knights rode into battle with ideals as their most potent weapon. As we reflect on Edward's final years, we are reminded of the fragility of life. But more importantly, we are inspired by the resilience of the human spirit. 
for in the face of adversity, both personal and political, Edward's unwavering commitment to his people and his principles serves as a poignant testament to the strength of character. In the vast tapestry of history, where countless souls ebb and flow like threads, weaving intricate patterns, some figures loom large, casting an indelible mark. Edward, the Black Prince, is undoubtedly one such figure. As we culminate this journey through his life, we are compelled to reflect on the shadow he cast, one that has endured through the corridors of time, outlasting the ephemeral glow of lesser luminaries. His life, though marked by the triumphs of military campaigns and the challenges of governance, is not just a tale of battlefield glory or political acumen. It's a tale of a man, armoured in obsidian, yes, but beneath that armour beat a heart fuelled by chivalric ideals, honour, and a profound sense of duty. Centuries have passed, but Edward's legacy has resisted the decay of time. The very mention of the Black Prince conjures images of gallant knights, fierce battles, and a time when one's word was their bond. He became, in essence, the embodiment of the chivalric ideal, a benchmark against which subsequent generations of warriors, leaders, and statesmen would be measured. It's easy to remember Edward for his military genius, especially during the Hundred Years' War. His tactics and leadership at Creasy and Poitiers were not just victories for England, they were masterclasses in military strategy. These battles showcase the innovative spirit of the English forces and change the face of medieval warfare. Yet, to reduce Edward to just these battles would be an injustice to his multidimensional personality. His leadership transcended the battlefield. Edward was a diplomat and an administrator. His governance in Aquitaine, albeit marked by challenges, showed a leader keen on bridging divides and ensuring prosperity for his subjects. Edward understood that true leadership wasn't about ruling with an iron fist, but about understanding and addressing the needs of the people. It was a delicate dance of strength and empathy, of assertion and concession. Beyond the duties of a prince and warrior, Edward was a man of profound personal integrity. His love story with Joan of Kent wasn't just about royal alliances, but a genuine bond of affection and understanding. In Joan, Edward found a partner, a confidence, and a steadfast supporter. Their story is a testament to the fact that even in the high-stakes world of medieval politics, genuine love could flourish. But perhaps the most enduring aspect of Edward's legacy is the symbol he became. The Obsidian Knight is a moniker that speaks volumes. It evokes strength and mystery, resilience and depth. Edward's black armour, whether a product of myth or reality, came to symbolise a figure who was unyielding in the face of adversity and unwavering in his commitment. Today, castles may crumble, and old battlefields may be overtaken by the inexorable march of progress, but legends like Edward, the Black Prince, resist obliteration. They are immortalized in songs, stories, and the collective memory of a civilization. Such figures become touchstones, reminding us of our past and guiding our future. For castle enthusiasts, the life of the Black Prince is particularly poignant. These grand edifices of stone and might were not just fortresses, but symbols of power, legacy, and ambition. Edward's life echoed these very sentiments. His journey from the towering turrets of Windsor Castle to the battlefields of France is a reflection of an era where castles were not just structures but living, breathing entities bearing silent testimony to the sagas of those who inhabited them. In conclusion, as we stand on the precipice of time, looking back at the age of knights and castles, Edward the Black Prince stands tall, not just as a prince or a warrior, but as a beacon of what it means to live by one's principles, his legacy, armoured in obsidian, serves as a powerful reminder that true greatness transcends battles, politics, or time. Why, out of countless stories of chivalry and valour, has his tale cast such an irresistible spell on castle enthusiasts for generations? 
By the age of twelve, he was already showing signs of the warrior he was destined to become, often besting knights many years his senior in mock battles. A boy who loved listening to tales of valor, just as much as he enjoyed the laughter of the castle's children. The royal household was not just a seat of power, but a complex web of relationships and responsibilities. Edward was born into this tapestry as the eldest son of King Edward, a position fraught with expectation and duty. From a tender age he was groomed to one day wear the crown. Every step, every decision was seen through the prism of his royal destiny. When the union was finally revealed, it sent ripples through the English court. Many eyebrows were raised, many tongues wagged, but Edward's commitment to Joan remained unshaken. It lies in the heart, in honour, and in the undying spirit of duty. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Saving Castles podcast. Stay tuned for our next episode where we'll continue to explore the fascinating world of castles and chateaus. Don't miss out and subscribe to our podcast to get notified when new episodes are released. For more information about us and our work, visit savingcastles.com. Thank you for listening.